Stephen Barry, in my mind, most probably came over with the potato famine like a lot of Irish people did. There were a million deaths during the famine. In 1845, he's 46 years old, so at peak time. By 1851, a quarter of Liverpool's population was Irish-born. Many of the Irish people who came over used what was known as the casual ward system, which is where they would work during the day in low-paid manual work and then stay in a casual ward where they would be expected to pay a token sum and if they couldn't, they'd be given a task of hard labour. And your options were, you know, go in the workhouse, starve to death or steal. Got to go right back to the Industrial Revolution in a way where you, where you get people coming in from the, the countryside because there's no work for them there anymore. It's all been mechanised and there's not enough jobs to go around. You filter people out by, by their fitness. He's a labourer, so he would have had trouble getting a job as a labourer. But I think generally in industry, you start filtering them out by whether they can read, write and do arithmetic. So you start also employing people who have had a good education. So he most probably had a lot of trouble getting work. Far, far more people out of work than in it. No unions and, and no disability rights. We do treat immigrants pretty badly in a way, I think. The mindset, isn't it, how you look at them? And I guess that same mindset would have been about with all these Irish coming over and putting English people out of a job. So I think he would have been treated differently, actually, for being Irish. 26 Vagrancy Act forbade you from sleeping rough, so you'd have to sleep in some form of accommodation. Otherwise, you would be, you know, given a couple of days hard labour down the police pound, so you had to find somewhere to stay. If you were. The 1834 poor, poor laws generated another type of care and it's quite likely Stephen Barry might have gone off somewhere for three months where he found there was some work lived in the casual ward system while he was working so you've got this itinerant labor force traveling around the country where there was a little bit of casual work for cash in hand and you had to look after that cash if you drunk it away after work and you didn't have any money to pay for your casual ward you would find yourself uh, breaking stone or chopping wood the next morning uh, and then you would go and report back for work four or five hours late only to find out that that uh, job is now gone so you had to be able to travel you had to be able-bodied to do that you would find people who could no longer travel they could still lay a brick or make a door but they couldn't get to where the work was because they had arthritis or they'd been injured or they were just too weak to do it and so the building of Guildford Union Workhouse by the pauper labour, by these labours found in the 18 to 20 parish work or poor houses, the fact that they built it just demonstrates that. Guildford Union Workhouse looked after the poor of 21 parishes. In 1881, those parishes would have had about a population of about 40, 30 to 40,000 people. Now, I'm not 100% sure that Woking, that hill, would have come under the Guildford Union. So the chances are you're now taking in somebody, you're going to have to pay for the cost of keeping somebody who hasn't come from your parishes, if you like. We don't know exactly why he was being refused entry, but it was bound to be on something like cost. The person who assesses who is allowed in the workhouse and who isn't is a chap called the relieving officer. And generally, for the able-bodied poor, it was straight into the workhouse. The significant thing here is that a relieving officer is sent to Woking invalid prison to have a look at this chap and that journey alone would have been a day of the relieving officer's time so the relieving officer assessed him and saw him as you know bedridden invalid and and it, there was this sort of mercy you know well we, we'll have to look after him then you know because he is sick he's invalid he's infirm those people had a slightly different classification in the workhouse they were not able-bodied poor not capable of working not idle they they had nothing else and therefore they were treated in a better way because it was not seen as not being their fault that they needed uh, relief from the workhouse. Amongst the working classes and the less well-off, only one in four people survived to their 25th birthday. You didn't have guards on farm machinery, lots of dangers. Families with children who could who could travel would try to stay together as a family unit and use that family unit to help in the, the, the work. But the family had to be taken into the workhouse. The male, or the male and the female, could go to the Board of Guardians and say, look, if you let us leave our children here, we can go and get some work, and then we can send some money back to you. And there's quite
quite a few records of this happening at Guildford. You had institutionalised children who were taught how to read, write and do arithmetic. And the idea is they could then get a job. They could then afford to keep a family. The trouble is they'd grown up in an institution. So they started making these scattered homes with a couple to learn what family life was about. And rather than going to the workhouse school, they would go to a local school. But there was a system there, and there was a system of care. It's very hard to know what the true story is, um, really, whether it was a good good place or a bad place. And that's something people still argue about today, whether they were good or bad.